Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 10. And this is session... Somebody help me. 23. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so... Here, and so they're going to put the power of Baal on display if they can. So here it goes. 1 Kings 18, 26. And they took the bullock which was given to them. They dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning, even until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. I really like Elijah. He's sarcastic. And I mean, I just like that for him, and said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's talking, or he's pursuing, or he's in a journey, peradventure he sleepeth, must be awakened. I mean, they've been going at it from, from morning to noon, and now Elijah's going, hey, maybe, maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe he's busy talking to somebody, just I can't hear you. Or maybe he's asleep. You need to wake him up. All right, and verse 28, and they cried aloud, and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied till the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. They've been going at this all day. And there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Okay, so that, that was their turn. And so... Here's what Elijah's going to do. Now, I'm kind of going to shorten this up a little bit. Elijah calls the people over to him. So here it is. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. How'd the altar of the Lord get broken down? It's these 450 prophets of Baal jumping around, cutting themselves, throwing themselves on the altar, running around, being crazy. Uh, and so uh, Elijah puts the altar back together. And, 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 and then he does some other things. We're not going to read the passage. You can go read it yourself. It's very interesting. He takes, he takes the wood and he bundles it up. And, and he lays the bullock on it. And then he surrounds it with 12 stones. He says, one stone for each of the 12 tribes of Israel who are called by the name of the Lord. That's that whole issue of understanding God's plan and purpose for Israel. And then he digs a ditch around this altar. And then he asks the people to bring four barrels of water. And they pour the water on top of the bullock. It soaks the, the sacrifice. It soaks the wood. It gets into the ground. It runs off. It gets into the ditch and swirls around the ditch. And then he asked them a second time, bring four more barrels. And they do the same thing with every barrel. They dump it and they completely soak the sacrifice, the wood and the ground, the rocks, and, it, and the water gets off into the ditch. And he says, do it a third time. Now that is pretty significant. And that's not what I'm here to talk about, but I just want to mention it to you. Why is it significant that Elijah would call for the people to take 12 barrels of water and pour it on the sacrifice. Yeah, because they haven't had rain for three and a half years. There's no crops. The fruit trees can't get enough water to survive. You know what he's asking for? Give me the water you have left. And he's soaking the sacrifice. Now the ditch is full. And Elijah's going to pray a short prayer. And we're going to see this now. 1 Kings 18, 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have, and this is really important for our purposes, that I have done all these things at thy word. Elijah is not just playing it by ear. This is all he says in his own prayer being done at the behest of God himself. And so this is not his imagination like we talked about last time. Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me. 
that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. And now he fin and that's the end of it. It's not a big long deal. No jumping around. No, you know, crazy business. And so here it is. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. I think for the purposes of being able to distinguish between what happened with the prophets of Baal and what happened with Elijah's sacrifice. It was pretty dramatic, wouldn't you say? And so, with that testimony, here's what happens. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's what God was waiting for. So, Elijah's not going to pray, we read it in James, the prayer for God to send rain until the people now no longer halt between two opinions. Now, they have returned to the Lord. And so, what's interesting here, by the way, is in 1 Kings 18, where the, the story is actually unfolded, you don't find Elijah praying for God to send rain after the people have returned to the Lord. Take a look. Just read through it with me. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to, to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Do you find anything in there about Elijah praying for it to rain? You don't find anything in the original account about that. But when you get over to the book of James, now you do. So here it is. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. You may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I, I know we just read it, but I'm reading it again because I'm going to make another point about this. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. It might not rain. It rained not in the earth by a space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So we do see in James that he did pray again. Now, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But let me ask you, did David ever pray for it to not rain? The answer is no. Solomon? No. How about Elisha, who came after Elijah? No, the answer is no. And we could go through the whole list here. How about Isaiah? Isaiah never prayed that prayer. In fact, you could go through all the prophets. Jeremiah? Nope. Ezekiel? Nope. Daniel? Nope. How about Jesus? Nope. How about the twelve? Nope. How about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Nope. Here's my question. Why, why is Elijah the only one to pray that prayer? Because he knew exactly where he was on the timeline and what God was going to be doing. The other folks didn't pray that prayer because if you were before the second course of punishment... It wasn't time to do that yet. If you were after the second course of punishment, God was going to be doing other things, not that. Do you see? I'm trying to get across the idea that these guys are not just waking up and going, I think I'm going to ask God for it. No, they're not. These are prayers that are intelligent. And what I mean is, 
They're, they're informed as to what God is actually wanting to do. And their prayers are in accordance. I spent last week to show you all those prayers of David and Solomon were in perfect accordance with what God said he wanted to do. They didn't dream up one stitch of it. And now here's Elijah, and he's praying for precisely what God said he wanted to do. What I got left here? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, he prayed again, yeah, oh, oh, I see, and he, yeah, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and yeah, right, it, no, it didn't give his actual prayer, I see what you're saying, right, now, someone is going to look at that, and they did, they looked at that today, and they said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, so we can pray, if we're out here, we need rain, and you know what, we need to pray that it rain, but see, it's, that's, that's, it's not in a, effectually fervent prayer unless it's in accordance with what God has said. Remember when I showed you what, Eli what Elijah prayed? He said, and Lord, I've done all these things at thy word. I'm not inventing it. Y'all pray for me, I'll win the lottery. You, you see what I'm saying? That's how we like to do it. Praying properly is really something is so far from what we got taught. It is so unfamiliar. And, it, and it's a little bit uncomfortable. That if you don't, that's why I go through this, because I want you to see that doing this right solves a lot of questions. Well, why did God answer Gloria's prayer and he didn't answer mine? I mean, that's what it looks like, right? But the truth is, even though Gloria prayed for something that got done, if God is doing it, if God's doing it, guess who he's doing it for? He's doing it for everybody. I, I spent time showing you this a few weeks back. You've already forgotten? I, he's going to do it for And he's doing it today on the basis of what? grace. There's only two ways to get it. You either get it as a free gift of grace, or you get it by you get it by works. Well, if it's by grace, then you don't need to work. So you can't say, well, I didn't get it because I don't deserve it, or God's punishing me. We went through all that. If you, if you, if, by the way, we, we went over to Ephesians. He hath blessed us with how many spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus? All spirit. There is not one more for you to get. Okay, now, now, uh, what I want to do, and, 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 and that's, so I, I just, do you see that with Elijah? Now let's go to Daniel. So, uh, in the context, by the way, later, the southern kingdom is carried away captive. But they're not carried away by Assyria. They're carried away by Babylon. And uh, does Daniel know about what's written in the book of Leviticus? You better believe he does. He absolutely knows. And so, does he, does he know why? Babylon came and carried them away captive? Sure. Because they transgressed against the Lord. They wouldn't do, do, do what they were supposed to do. But then, take a look, Daniel 9, 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Wait a minute, the realm of the Chaldeans? That's the Babylonians. So, where are we on the timeline here? Darius... In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes. Who, who can, you, had, you had Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is in power, remember? 
and they're carried away captive. But then when his son Belshazzar takes over, remember the writing, the handwriting on the wall, and the kingdom is going to be given to the Medes and the Persians. The Medo-Persian Empire is what follows. Daniel tells you, the one that follows the Medes and the Persians is Greece. He tells you. He lays those kingdoms out in order. And so here's the first year of Darius, who is a Mede. Which tells you what? Where are you on the timeline? I'm not talking about a year date. I'm talking about ba Babylon has already risen to power, had their time, and now they have fallen to the Medes and the Persians. That's why he is king over the realm of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. So, so where are you on the timeline? This is over. How long did Jeremiah say that that fifth course of punishment... When it opened up and they were carried away captive, how long were they going to be carried away captive? Seventy years. So if you're Daniel and Babylon has fallen, what do you now know? Just, just be him. For, I just need you to pretend to be him for a minute and know what he knows. Is that fair? About this. You, you know you were carried away captive to Babylon. You know that the captivity was going to be for 70 years. And now you've watched the Medes and the Persians take over. Belshazzar has fallen. And now Darius is the king over that realm. And so that makes you know what? You're, yeah, you're at the end of the 70 years, which means you get to go back home. You get to go back. You get to go back to the land. So here's what Daniel... So, so because, because that's what's going on there. So look, Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So that, he said, I understood because I read it in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's prophecy that he wrote, I read it in there that the desolations of Jerusalem are going to be for 70 years. We've been carried away. The land's been lying dormant. We've been gone. And now the Medes and the Persians are in, the Medes are in control and so I realize I'm right here at the end. So I'm going to be asking the Lord, what? Can, yeah, it, can we go back? Is it time to go back? Is this it? So let's uh, look at it in Leviticus 26. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste, then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemies' lands, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. Now we're going to keep reading, but see, that happened, didn't it, when they were carried away captive by the Babylonians. That, that's exactly what happened. Now, as long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. What does that mean? It didn't rest in your Sabbath when you dwelt on it. What was the rule about the land? You're planting on the land, but what was supposed to happen? Every seven years, you're supposed to let the land rest. They did not do that. They planted right on through, right on through, right on through. And God said, you know what? I'm going to get those years back. So you're going to go completely out of the land, and it's going to get all of its years back while you're over there in captivity. So let's keep... So, uh, verse 36, And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts in the land of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall one upon another as it were before a sword when none pursueth, and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. 
and you shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up, and they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of your father shall they pine away with them. That's exactly what happened to them. And, and because Daniel knows that, and now the 70 years, and he knows how long now, because Leviticus didn't tell him 70 years, Jeremiah told him 70 years. So now let's skip this down to 45. I'm sorry, 45, 40. Uh, and if they shall confess their iniquity, and this is how they get out, by the way. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespasses, which they trespassed against me, and that also they walk contrary unto me, and I have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. So what is God waiting to see? Contrite heart, a willing to confess their sins, we did wrong, we deserve what we got. You ever heard someone apologize? All right, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have... What, what, the word but should never be in an apology sentence. And it should not also be the first word in the next sentence. So that's what the, God is waiting to hear. Verse uh, 45, But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. So it's with that knowledge. So here you are. Now just pretend with me for a moment. You're Daniel, and now you know all of this. You know that God said he was going to take you away captive. You know it was going to be for 70 years. You've been over there in Babylon now for all this time. And now you see Darius, who is a Mede. He is the king over all the Chaldean Empire. And you realize the time is, and you, you, you're thinking you can go back home. But what is God waiting to hear from you? We did, we did evil. We committed iniquity. We deserved it. We, you know what? We got what was coming to us. We've learned our lesson. All of that kind of business. And so when he begins to talk to the Lord about, is it, can we go home? Look, look what he begins to say. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Why is he starting out like this? Because that's the prescription Leviticus 26 called for. What am I showing you this for? It is another example that, Dave, that Daniel is not just making it up. His prayer is in perfect accordance with what he has already seen God wants to hear. I, I'm showing you all these, and I think sometimes we get lost in the middle of it. But I started with David. We could have started before that. I showed you this is exactly what David was doing. He's praying exactly what God said he was doing. Here's Solomon. Prayed exactly what God said he was doing. Here's Elijah. Knowing where he is and what is happening, he prays exactly what he ought to be praying. Now we're at Daniel. Daniel's praying exactly what was said. God was waiting to hear. Nobody is just pulling it up out of the blue and asking God for a bunch of stuff or to do a bunch of stuff. But we see these examples, and I'm not through showing them to you. I'm almost, because I, I think you get the point. But we could go through and show you all the way through, all the way through, all the way through, all the way through. And then you know what we do? We dream it up. And we wonder, how come they don't get answered? 
I'm trying to show you. This is not me telling you this is what we ought to do. This has been praying in accordance with the dispensation has been the only way people have really properly prayed. It's not a new thing. Okay. So here's the next one. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faith, to our kings and our princes and our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his prophets, the servants. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. We're in the fix we're in. We're under this captivity. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God. You know what that is? The oath that was written in the law of Moses? It's Leviticus 26. What's an oath? It's a promise. Here's what God said. I promise. You keep going the way you're going and you're going to be captive in your enemy's lands. He's referring to that. Why? Because we have sinned against him. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to do. Verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. See, when I ask you that question, it was loaded. Do you think Daniel knew about what was written over there in Leviticus 26? He actually references it here. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. He said, we weren't interested in that. And then verse 16. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. See, this is going right back to why God founded the city of Jerusalem with them to begin with. Back to God's plan and purpose with them. And so, let's just keep reading it. Now therefore, O Lord... Hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate. What is that? That's the temple that Solomon built. For the Lord said, Oh my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. He understands exactly what that principle is. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. That's, that's that same issue again. When we come back after the break, I'm going to show you that there are two major issues in this prayer. We just need to, when we see them, it'll make sense why in the world that we point them out. Because it is showing that Daniel understands exactly what God is doing. And his prayer is according to that. Okay, so we'll stop here, we'll take a break, and then we'll come back.